found. So we, boom. What's up, y'all? My name is Ian Edwards, and welcome to the Soccer Comic Rant. And this is our midweek rant. And uh, we're on all things comedy. Thanks for listening on iTunes, Spotify, Lipson, Stitcher, and all things comedy. And if you're watching on YouTube, what up, everybody? Uh, like and subscribe and leave comments. And uh, we'll hear to you after results from Champions League midweek, Europa League midweek, and United getting robbed today. Uh, we don't know what the hell happened to Liverpool yesterday. They have no excuse. Uh, Thomas Tuchel got fired, and uh, you know Neil has the whole deal on that, and uh, and then you know whatever else is going on in football, and Lee is in England. The Queen just died, and uh, that which you know she lived a great life, and uh, so we're just wondering how much that will affect football because they're planning on canceling or postponing some things because of the death of the queen so we'll see what's up with that and so let me just introduce uh lee hudson stand a comic from england southampton fan what's up fam sorry hey, about the queen bro uh, I, I doesn't really change my <laughs> life at all um it was a weird night though like i i had um i was on a, i i heard out, i found out like half an hour before i was due to go on a show um and so we turned up at the venue and we're like what's going to happen here um but the audience all showed up and we told them our <laughs> jokes so everyone was cool uh but some, your life it was, it was a good show um but some some a bunch of stuff got cancelled tonight uh it was weird and mm -hmm. yeah like you saw like the arsenal game had a minute silence at half time and right. yeah it was everything was a little bit a little bit weird it felt a bit dystopian as well like i was walking back to my car after the show and every electronic billboard in the city has her face on it so like oh, yeah. bus stops all have her face on it and there's all these billboards everywhere like it felt a little bit like sci-fi it was kind of weird mm. so how does this just in case you didn't know she was important yeah <laughs> yeah if you I mean, can tell from all, all the, the yeah <laughs> if you can tell from all the money and all the jewels on her head <laughs> yeah <clears throat> she, she she was the blame queen uh, what up, Neil? How you doing, fam? I'm good. I'm great. I, you know, I've got a lot of uh, time to process what happened this week. And yeah, I'm fine now. Had a good night's sleep. <laughs> yeah, I was worried about you. <laughs> uh, so, Neil, Shaka I, I was a little worried about comic. me too. Like, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yesterday, uh, yeah, like I saw the news at 7.30 in the morning and it took me a long time to get to actually start working. Mm -hmm. I was like, I might be getting fired. I'd be the next one getting fired. <laughs> Hilarious. And because Grandpa of the Tuco. Take your job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. So the question is, what's going to happen this week? Is England taking the week off because of the death of the Queen? Is there going to be football this weekend or what's the deal? I think I think there will be football. Um, from the sounds of it, there's all the meetings are taking place tomorrow with the um, the relevant leagues and the TV companies and everyone who's involved. And I think they'll sort of gauge it on the national mood they've said. But I think most people want stuff to go ahead, and the government and the sort of the you know the people, the representatives at the palace have said like things should go ahead because um, you know they don't want major disruption, which I think is fair. Um, you know, people who want to be sad about it can be sad about it. Um, no one's stopping that. But I don't think the whole country should shut down completely and not allow anyone to do anything that they might enjoy um, just because of it. It sounds like tomorrow, because it's like the first full day tomorrow after she's died. Like, I think everything tomorrow will get scrapped, but mm -hmm. that's fine because nothing really happens on a Friday anyway. There's no, I think there might be like one championship game that gets cancelled or something. Um, right. But then I, th I think the weekend will be business as usual. Um and then next weekend, it's the weekend after some stuff might get disrupted, depending on if it's the funeral day. Um, any game, I don't think there'll be any games that take place on the funeral day. But they don't know when the funeral day will be yet. <laughs> right. How long, how long do they normally take to bury, like, a queen? It's like 10 days. Uh, 10 days. There's a whole bunch of ceremonial shit it's that a full needs to happen. It's a full episode of The Crown. Yeah, yeah basically. That's, what we, that's yeah. what we had you pull out of work for. <laughs> like how will the crown affect football <laughs> you know uh, 
but yeah, apparently it's 10 days after the death. So that I think would take us up to like Monday, Tuesday. Uh, it's like international break, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, be, be perfect. Be good timing if that's the case. Yeah, yeah. No, right. respect to the Queen for, uh, you know, for not interrupting football, yeah. hopefully, maybe. I think uh, um, also like, because it's a World Cup year, and mm-hmm. the World Cup's in the middle of the season. The schedule was already tight as fuck anyway. So um, I think mm-hmm. they don't really want to be cancelling games and having to find extra time to play those games because there isn't much extra right. time to play them. So, um, you know, not that that's uh, <laughs> the most important thing, but it's pretty fucking important. It's a business that the whole thing needs <laughs> to carry on running still. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure they'll find a way to keep playing. I don't, I don't think football fans are going to be that cut up about it. Some might, some won't, but I don't mm-hmm. think, you know, Go to a football game sad. Man United fans go to most football games sad anyway. So, well, not the last few weeks, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, today for sure. Today, after today's game. I love yeah. how Lee had a wide array of teams to pick, uh, pick from for that punchline and uh-huh. he chose Man United. Yeah. I, I forgot that they've been doing well recently, but um, <laughs> it's because, you know. We- when you said it, I forgot too. That's how bad we were doing for so long. <laughs> I was like, and I was like, wait a minute, wait, we just well, we, we did lose today, but we're talking. Um, about oh shit, that. they are out there. So uh, today doesn't count. You rotate well, actually, you only rotated maybe three or four players, didn't you? you? It was quite a strong team you put out still. Yeah, we we rotated like four, maybe five, I think. Yeah, like you changed and, up uh, the centre backs. The Fred, centre backs. Um, Casemiro came in. Casemiro started with Fred. Ronaldo. Uh, Bruno Bruno was on the bench and then we started Ronaldo and Elanga and Anthony who's brand new so it's almost technically a top a, a brand new starting you know front three but uh yeah but we'll, 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 we'll get into that so I, I guess the other major things two major things we got to discuss is the state of Chelsea like what happened yesterday we woke like this there's been the news uh the, just crazy English news like drops in the middle of the night and uh, or in the middle of the day or whenever because the, the Queen's, the dropping of the Queen's death happened mid-football. But yesterday, Thomas Tuchel got sacked and you was reading an article, Neil, about in the Athletic. So what did the Athletic basically say about the relationship between Tuchel and Bowley and what really happened according to the athletic i mean in a way like first off like you know well like generally whenever these breakups happen like i've you know as a chelsea fan i've been through enough sackings right so mm-hmm. it, it's like this whole flow is not new to me but so so i've i don't know how much value to be put on these uh uh articles kind of sometimes seem like hit pieces once the guy, you know, he's dead, he's not there to defend himself anymore. And mm-hmm. um, obviously the owners, they need to put their, um, they put their narrative out, get ahead of things. Because they spent, I think, a good part of 24 hours getting absolutely lambasted from everybody, from fellow uh, colleagues in the footballing world, like experts, analysts, uh, and fans. Like, and this is probably the... Um, the first sacking in a long, long time where there was absolutely nobody from the fan base calling for player, the manager to be sacked. Like, usually when sackings happen, like when Lampard, you know, uh, like people like me, we wanted Lampard to continue because we felt it was just a bad patch of form about a month or so. But there were a good number of fans who were pointing out, like, hey, look, we're in December, we're in January, and we are uh, ninth in the table. He needs to go. So, you always have these divided opinions like with uh, Conte, we know what happened. And then Mourinho was 16th on the table. Like with Hugo, we were like three points of the top four. Okay, we lost to Zagreb, but you know that's a group stage game. Um, the other two teams split points. Probably does not not going to have a big impact on the group. So nobody really, like even people like me who had started you know, pointing a few fingers at Hugo, Nobody was really saying sack the manager. So it just came completely out of the blue. So that being the case, everybody's obviously on the mono or on the owner's head. Like, you know, what the hell have you done? So I think that article is 
also partly a response to that, you know, trying to show that, hey, we are not just absolute buffoons or absolute mavericks, you know, we do have a plan and there were reasons building up to it and we, you know, these things that happened. So, and what were some of those things? So some of what those was the things, things leading up to it? Yeah. So, so what they say is that when they took over the club, they were really happy that they had in Thomas Tuchel for the men's team and Emma Hayes in the women's team, two managers mm -hmm. who were at, you know, near the top of the profession and they can trust the, the future at Chelsea, of Chelsea with them. But apparently soon they found out with Tuchel in the whole summer when they were trying to, you know, do the spending, do the recruitment. So first off, you made Tuchel, um, Tuchel's been going through a lot, right? Like since the last year, like he's had to basically start giving speeches like politician, like answering questions in press conference, that have nothing to do with the sport. Mm -hmm. So he dealt with all that. Now he's going into a summer without a director of football. So which now may means that he not only has to give his input in um, recruitment, he also has to essentially be the guy who is, you know, who's making footballing decisions and even explaining footballing decisions to these new owners who are from America. And these guys wanted way more involvement than what they were receiving from Tuchel. Tuchel, Tuchel I guess, at some point was like, hey, I got to coach these guys, you know, tactics. Mm -hmm. Like I, I need to be on the training pitch with these guys, but they mm -hmm. wanted very, um, you know, they essentially wanted him to not be a part-time director of football. They want, uh, they wanted him to be a full-time director of football while being a full-time coach, mm -hmm. and that caused some friction. Uh, and certain players, like for example, uh, Ronaldo, uh, Boli really wanted Ronaldo, and. Uh, Duke has said, you know, he doesn't want him and he gave us reasons, but those reasons were not enough. And Boli and the other guy, Begdali, apparently they really wanted, they sounded some sort of a PowerPoint presentation as to why, okay, give me a detailed explanation as to why you're saying no to this guy who we've heard is the best footballer on the planet, right? And I think Duke left a point, he goes, he was like, what, what, do, what do you want me to say? Like, he doesn't see the way we play. Now, I really don't know what level of nuance do these guys even understand about top level football that certain answers which to me and you who you know we're not in the footballing business, but you know, we watch them of football to understand mm -hmm. what, what players work for, what teams and what managers. But they prob they probably just couldn't fathom the fact that this guy doesn't want Cristiano Ronaldo. So that was one mm -hmm. of the points of um, uh, tension. Tension, and then um, the whole um, Jules Kunde thing. They again was you know he had Tuchel wanted Wesley Fofana, but all the data was apparently they they wanted um, uh, Kunde, and there were like a lot of these things. Apparently, Gabriel Jesus was offered to Chelsea. Tuchel said no, and they again that is something in which case I actually side with the owners on this because I wanted Jesus, I felt he would be good. But, mm -hmm. um, and then he, they apparently wanted him to be part of a WhatsApp group uh, where all of these <laughs> discussions are happening on a detailed basis. <laughs> now, I know, like, there are people who don't like being on WhatsApp groups because it's, it's a lot of clutter, you know. You uh -huh. can't deal with it, especially in a, if you're in a high-profile, high-stress job like Duke is, which anyway takes up so much of your time. He... <laughs> He, you know, he, he, he said, I'll pass on this, like, you know, um, I'll give you my opinions. And then, so all of this essentially. Imagine like passing on the WhatsApp group and then you go coach for a few hours and you come back and you have <laughs> a thousand texts to read. <laughs> it's like you missed yeah. an argument with your girlfriend or your wife <laughs> and now you got to catch up and figure yeah. out what a reply is. So that you don't get a thousand more texts. And you can't that is just crazy. Miss, you can't just miss a few um, texts because those might be the texts that you know that mm -hmm. uh, that mean that there's a difference between life and death in terms of your job. So, mm -hmm. so I think a lot of that's like fit-wise, it didn't really work. And uh, uh, 
but what I don't understand is if that was the case, and they're saying that this decision was made even before the Zagreb came. Before the Zagreb came, what happened? That was the end of the transfer window. On the last day, you got Obamaya, who is a Tuchel signing. Like, mm -hmm. if you had these things in your head, why did you give this guy 300 million, uh, almost 250, sorry, 250 million pounds to spend? Almost all of them being, I think, except Zakari on deadline day. The rest mm -hmm. of the guys were all Tuchel signings. So it just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, they can come up with a lot of, uh, I know a lot of murky details and start coming out, but I think we got- But what did, they, what did they say? Like, because I think you gave me a combination of what you think happened based on what's in the athletic and yeah. your opinion, but what did yeah. they say? No, so the, the Ronaldo athletic? thing, the Ronaldo thing, Jesus mm -hmm. thing. And then apparently on the thing was Tuchel at the beginning of preseason had a meeting where the entire squad and asked people essentially who wants to be here, who doesn't want to be here. Mm -hmm. And um, he was a little surprised by the number of people who said they don't want to be here. And we already know oh, that a lot of those people are not there, like Lukaku, mm -hmm. and they're not in, um, in the squad anymore. But mm -hmm. One weird thing he did was he then went ahead and had separate team meetings, not once, but a couple of times with these two different groups of players who said they want to be here versus those who said they don't want to be here. And then in some of the games, when the season actually began, he started giving mm -hmm. minutes to players who said they didn't want to be here. And that confused the folks, you know, who said, you know, we're committed to Chelsea. We want to be here. We are here. And mm -hmm. so that again saying mixed signals. So that caused some friction with some of the players. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a case of him losing the dressing room because from all the evidence we have, the vast majority, like I went through like the entire 25 man squad. I think mm -hmm. most players are players who Tuchel really has trusted, given our opportunities to, or are Tuchel signings. So except for Pulisic and Ziyech, I really don't think right now we have any players who would necessarily be unhappy with Tuchel. So, and I don't think Pulisic and Siash, I don't think they have the personality to lead a school choir, let alone, you know, lead a dressing room into, into the game. So, Jeez. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think that could be a um, real source. I think one of the things they're saying is that they wanted to, the owners wanted to, analyze and review, take a stock of things at, on the, at the 100 day ownership mark. And that just happened, mm -hmm. which again tells me it's, a, it's, it's very, um, you know, it, it's, it's very investment firm takeover style, consultancy group style um, management of a, of a business where, because the 100 day mark essentially has no meaning. Because the season just began, the transfer window just that's, closed. That's some American so, presidency, pre yeah. presidency thing. Like, exactly. uh, like when Obama came to office, or whenever somebody comes to office, they have this hundred day thing, and it's a, it's a, card, yeah. a show to the people who voted for them, or to the people who are uh, like, ah, they ain't gonna do nothing. That yeah. you know, a sense of accomplishment, and it's like mm -hmm. I've never seen that really in football before, but it's definitely like an American political thing. And they're saying yeah. like you know, so essentially it's it's essentially a personality. So clash, on their list a of, of of a hundred day things was to fire the coach. <laughs> no, <is> that, <laughs> the list of hundred day thing was to review whether this coach is fit for what they want to do, and apparently he wasn't. But the, the they wore him ragged. Saying, the the team was like ninety eight. The transfer window closed on the ninety ninth day. What do you want me to do? I bet you Tuchel is like fired home now, still getting texts in the WhatsApp group going, how come you're not responding? And he's like, you fired me. <laughs> Can <laughs> like, you imagine that? that the that's how we the... found out he was fired. Like I'm yeah. messaging, should we tell Tuchel he's fired? He's like, hey, I'm on here. Can you imagine the state of the WhatsApp group right now? You know, sometimes you have these groups and then like some fallout happens and then he's just lying there lonely. Like you don't know what to do. Do we exit the group? What do, what do the other people do? Start a new group. Yeah. He, he went on a walk today and he was pictured outside of his you know, house in, in Coburn. So, right. yeah, it's, it's sad. Like, I was really, really uh, disappointed as to what happened. 
Yeah, it felt like you fell in love with him because you put a post up about this is why you never really fall in love. And, you, and it is too cool talking about how excited he was to be at Chelsea. And it was yeah. felt like a great loss and, to you. You know, and this is the problem. Like, uh, this is kind of what's what's does to you because after Lampard, I told myself I'm never gonna, you know, <laughs> never gonna get emotionally attached to a manager. But I guess you can't really stop it. You can keep telling yourself this, but then once you know certain events happen, certain moments happen, you get sucked in. And yeah, go have part game, of, You know, bring on the game. Mr. The game Green. will always draw you back in. So yeah. <laughs> let me ask Lee before I ask you. So Graham Potter is definitely in, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Lee, what do you think about Graham Potter? Ex Southampton legend. Ex Southampton <laughs> legend. He played, played seven games for Southampton. He's, he's ex Southampton. <laughs> yeah, he's ex Southampton. <laughs> Legends uh, stretch. Um, but no, I mean, I think I think it's an interesting appointment. There's there's a whole bunch of pros and cons to it. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas the pros are mainly things that we know for sure about Graham Potter, and the cons mm-hmm. are mainly assumptions and unknowns. So the pros are that, you know, he's he's good at improving players. He's tactically quite smart. He's good at building a team. He's good at um, um, sort of motivating players and, and dealing with players on a one-to-one level. His man management's really good. Um, he plays a 3-5-2 system as well with three centre-backs and wing-backs. So the group of players that Chelsea have would already be suited to that. Um, mm-hmm. So he's got players there already that can play those roles. So there's there's some good things there. The assumptions people are making are that he can't manage big players or he's not managed big players before, but he's shown that he's got a real high level of emotional intelligence. And I think what he's done with clubs previously will buy him respect from the players initially. As long as he can back it up with the work he does when he arrives. I think a lot of Mm -hmm. top level players would be stupid if they looked at what he'd done at Brighton and don't give him any respect for that. But I think players will will want to... I think players will want to listen to him. I think he'll command... Um, the respect there due to what he's done in the game. Um, so that's mainly one of the things. And just, yeah, that's that's mainly a lot of the things that people are saying, like he hasn't won anything before at the top level. He's not managed top players before. And it's mm-hmm. like, well, everyone's got to get that experience at some point. So why not now? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, going back to what Neil said, though, the Tuchel cool sacking, I, I, I did find strange because it felt like a mini slump rather than anything like a real rotted set in or anything long standing. I think they could have easily pulled out of it. Um, so it is quite bizarre. But I think Potter's a good appointment. It's um they're gonna have to give him patience because I'd you know it'd be sad if he turns into one of those people who just end up there for the short term and then he's out again. Um although if he's out in time to be the next England manager, that would be mm-hmm. perfect. I wouldn't say no to that. Um, but I, th- I think he can be a success there. I think everything's there. And it was interesting that Athletic article was talking about um, how they mentioned when when Chelsea went to sign Kukurea, that was a deal that Todd Bowley went and completed. And apparently when he spoke to Kukurea, he already knew the full career history of Graham Potter, which for someone mm-hmm. who has come from a background that isn't football related to already know a lot about one guy um, mm-hmm. who isn't at his club. Uh, it sounded a little bit... Um, a little bit suspicious, like they'd already lined him up for something, maybe. Which I mean, clubs are entitled to do. They're all, you know. I think you're stupid if you're not thinking about Chelsea. Who your next Chelsea didn't even be. want Cucurella. They just wanted to take <laughs> Graham Potter out on a date by using Cucurella as bait. <laughs> yeah, just wanted that inside <laughs> like, info. Yeah, they just wanted to break the ice. It's like when you make you make friends with the girl you want to date, with the friend of the girl you want to date. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Basically, um, played the long game. That's, that's the most expensive long game ever. 60 mil yeah. to like just to break the ice with uh, Graham Potter. Neil, what do you think about this Graham Potter hiring? How do you feel? Are you going to fall in love or are you just going to be emotionally <laughs> aloof until you win a title? I mean, the thing with emotions, you don't really have a lot of control over that. So mm-hmm. I'm going to, uh, but you know, we've spoken about Potter a lot on this podcast and I've always really uh, been a full of praise of him like I mm-hmm. like the funny thing is the last time we spoke about Potter on this podcast Billy Gilmore going there so he must be yeah. like he must be on suicide watch <laughs> or something <laughs> he, he must be spinning be <laughs> he's like I just left to go play with Graham Potter and now he left where I was at to come coach where I'm not at what the fuck like my career um, so he uh, yeah, I mean, Potter, 
like he's one of those guys when you look at the next generation of coaches mm-hmm. he has he picks almost every box i mean the only thing he doesn't have is the fact that he's essentially let's be real like he's essentially marry uh, he's essentially managing a small town team like i think mm-hmm. the footballing population from what i've learned me you can correct me if i'm wrong but i think managers southampton sunderland managers have far more pressure than the brighton and hope <laughs> i don't think there is that sort of footballing um uh, you know the, the city is not as much on on his neck so he pretty much gets a free ride every every season and which is why he's you know he's able to work clearly work with whoever he wants to bring in that's not really going to be the case at chelsea he's he's kind of going to have to learn this aspect of the job uh, on the go and and there is no time for that so good thing is he's bringing his entire team uh, which i think is a real uh, it always has to happen but he's also bringing in not just his coaching staff he's bringing the, the recruitment guys which as we all know about um, brighton is a huge huge thing that has helped them in um, like even this year you see they, they lost the suma the last kukurera but you know they they been fine <laughs> they been more than fine they they been great so so, so let, let me ask you a question like that i guess this is a the, like why would brighton let all of that go like so they they don't have a choice yeah they uh, have brighton to financially had a, they had a release clause sort of a release clause and the release clause was not just about potter it involved the the entire team that i'm talking about oh for real So he had a release clause that if any team met it they could take him and the entire team. Yeah, that he works with. Damn. It didn't come cheap though. The release was almost like in your been 16 to 20 million pounds. Mm. Yeah. Holy got that. So what's up with the uh <laughs> what's up with the the scouts that are at Chelsea now or oh, the the scout is Bowley. Oh, we fired our head scout, which was one of the best things that we did. Like that's the one bully firing I'm in favor of because I, you know, he's he's been an absolute uh, waste of time for the longest it's, time. Um, it's it's not um, a whole team coming from Brighton though in terms of the yeah. scouting. It's just his um, his recruitment analyst, who's a guy called Carl McCauley, yeah. who I actually did a coaching course with back in Sweden in 2015. Oh, um, right. oh in cool. the early Potter years, he um, is very very switched on guy. He's been with Potter at every single club. um that he's gone to he's taken him from Ostersunds to Swansea to Brighton um and he'll be taken to Chelsea but he's just one guy so he'll be like the head of recruitment analysis um mm-hmm. so he's not like a sporting director or technical director he's not the person who does the deals but he'll be he's one who like he obviously knows exactly what type of player Potter needs in any position and he'll be working on finding out who you know they need in those positions so Chelsea will still need to appoint someone to go out and do the deals because I don't think it's healthy to have Bowley doing that. Mm. Um there needs to be someone in between Potter and and him. Yeah, they, they, uh, apparently from what I'm reading is that uh, um, <coughs> Potter has been given the authority to pick his uh sporting director which is kind of weird it's usually the other way around. Yeah. But um he's about to be uh you know, he, he's going to have full on for done with the next sporting director. That makes sense because it needs to be someone he can work with. Otherwise, it's just you're just inviting more uh, confrontation. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I guess we don't have that much time, so I just want to because we're gonna get off in less than in about twenty minutes. So, who's the coach of Brighton now? I know we said it in the in the chat, but. I just want to said here. I think the the temporary coach is Adam Lallana. He he's supposed to be taking charge of the next few games until they appoint somebody. With no team? Oh, no, it's um, it's a guy called it's a guy called Andrew Croft who's the under 21 coach. Oh, okay. And Lallana's going to be part of his staff. Oh, okay. okay. I thought Lallana's um, getting the No, it's, it's I I just found an article it says um yeah. So Andrew Croft he's so he's someone who's already at the club knows all the um the young players and what not but um yeah it's uh it's confirmed as Croft although it seems like it's the two of them actually <laughs> yeah I think I don't I don't know if Lana's just there to be sort of the 
you know the the one who deals with the players and Crofts deals with the uh, mm. um, the actual coaching because yeah Lanai has no experience really of this um, so it seems like yeah between the two of them they'll be taking charge of it I'd imagine they'll appoint someone fairly swiftly though um, like I was saying in the chat the the favorite with the bookies is um, Kietil Knutsen who's the uh, the Bodo glimpse manager who they took down Roma last year in the Europa League. They took down Milan the year before in that tournament. They drew 1-1 with PSV tonight, who are a team with a far bigger budget than them. Um, they've produced a couple of players who've gone on to join bigger clubs as well. So that's um, someone in the mould that they would potentially go for. Some of the other names on that list I'd be frightened with if I was a Brighton fan, though. <laughs> uh, again, look who's here. It's, it's Martin, Richarlison, oh. Harris. Uh, so let's let's go to some results real quick from, I guess, yesterday and today. So what happened with Liverpool versus Napoli? Wait, wait, wait. Did you guys talk about the Tuchel thing already or not yet? Yeah, 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 we Can did. Gonna, my... we, we don't want you have the time to go back there, man. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. But, well, I'm going to ask you about uh, Spurs. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you guys think about, what's your two cents on the, Liverpool, Napoli. Liverpool losing to Napoli. Was it 4-1? Yesterday, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't start the season well. I think there's a bunch of injuries added up to it. Uh, they don't have their midfield. I think uh, losing Sadio Mane, I spoke with, with a friend of mine who's a diehard Liverpool fan. And, you know, a lot of Liverpool fans, diehard Liverpool fans because, uh, you know, that's the group. Um, they're, they're not happy about Mana leaving and they think uh, Diaz is not even close to that level. And they, they feel like this uh, trio was uh, irreplaceable, you know, the way they played together. And if you take one of those three, uh, the other two also are not playing at the same level and the whole team suffers. But I would say the injuries and I would say defensively they slipped a bit. Um, and listen, you know, sometimes it's just uh, the team just burns out. Uh, at some football clubs like Chelsea, they burn out pretty quick. At some like Liverpool, wow. they also do. You know, nobody's uh, Pochettino burned out at some point at Tottenham. You know, like it happens. It happens, and then you move on and build something new. And maybe it is the season where it burns out at Liverpool, and and they will make change. I don't think they will fire Klopp. I think if if things don't work out, they'll just let him go at the end of the season. And uh, but they're still, they still world class. Uh, they will have moments where they will be great. I just don't, I think they lost too many points in the league. Uh, and I think uh, their Champions League form kind of admits there is a problem. Uh, you said lost too many points in the league. Yeah, they, they, they're already like, what, nine points behind City? They, 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 don't, they, they don't have that many points in the league, I don't think. Mm, they've dropped a They're six points behind. Arsenal, Arsenal's in the lead. Six points. Six points. Most of this, yeah. It, and that means five points behind City, five points behind T Tottenham. Okay. Uh, four points behind Brighton, who is probably going to drop now because yeah. Lalana's their coach. And uh, to be great coach, whoever that coach is. <laughs> yeah, but the whole team is gone. So, like, just expect Brighton to, like, I don't know. If somebody comes in with a different plan, it, they better get somebody with the same plan that can grab their attention and motivate them the way Potter did. And then Man United, and uh, then then Chelsea, who just lost their coach. Like yeah. they might get a new coach bounce, but who knows what will happen? I, then, I, I just heard a very interesting theory. Uh, very very interesting theory, by the way. You know about about about. Chelsea and Tuchel, the thing we told you we had no time for to go back to. And Christian Pulisic. <laughs> Martin, is this the same thing I told you we don't have time to go back to? No, 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 I know. It, just, it was just an interesting theory about <laughs> Pulisic, you know? Go ahead, Martin. I want to hear No, this. I've heard that, you know, Todd is a big fan of Pulisic, and he was very upset that Pulisic is not playing uh, for Chelsea, that he kind of fell out of favor. But that's it. That's it? All right. Yeah. So, so what do you guys... Like Martin was saying about Liverpool, uh, yesterday I watched uh, Carragher give a breakdown on what was wrong with Liverpool yesterday, and I agree with him. And it's basically, and, and I've kind of, I guess, after seeing him talk about it, realized 
yeah, that what is kind of missing the gig and press. The rock and roll is mm-hmm. gone. The rock is gone from the roll. Like normally, when Liverpool loses a ball, the midfield and the forwards will collapse on the person who just won the ball from the opposing team, and then they'll squeeze it out of them and then regurgitate it back into an attack. I haven't seen that happen all season or maybe a lot towards the end of last season, money or no money. But it all also stems back to, because when you don't do that, the team who is in possession of the ball has a chance to exploit your high line because now they have time to grab the ball, turn around, look up, and look for runs from their own teammates and pass it beyond the high line, which is what Napoli did uh, yesterday. So, I, I, like, you know, at the beginning of the season, I thought Liverpool would finish first. And I thought that their only weakness was their midfield. And it is an aged midfield. Like Milner is starting. He started multiple games. He's 38 years old. And the guys after him are close in age. And some of what Martin was saying and Carragher was saying it too, it's like after playing that system for so many years, you're burnt. You know, you're burnt. So they, they replenished. I don't think it's the problem is the forward line. I think those guys would score goals if they had a strong midfield to back them. I felt like that midfield was kind of weakened, but I didn't know it was this much weakened, you know, this this season. And it's so far, it's like like they have young players who are not experienced enough to give them what they want. And then after that, it's old guys. There's nobody in between and injuries. So it's a problem. I think Napoli were just very, very good as well. Like it was the perfect mix of a Liverpool team in the wrong kind of spot, taking on a Napoli team who were super up for the game. I mean, uh, they just signed this young Georgian kid, Kavica uh, Kavaracchelia, uh, which mm-hmm. they're calling him Kavaradonna, uh, the Napoli fans. Um, I mean, he's 21. He's, he looks like a real quality player. He's already scored four goals in five games for them. He looked great. Um, Diego Simeone's son, um, scoring on his Champions League debut 30 years or 25 oh, sure. years after um, his dad did. Um, so they both scored on the Champions League debuts. Um, that was a pretty cool okay. story as well. So Napoli just ruined them. But I mean, like you were saying, if, if, if the high line you're playing is because it relies on the press, if the press isn't there, then you might need to change something. Like Klopp showing himself to not be very flexible tactically by sort of only having this one style. It's like, mm-hmm. well, if, if you haven't got the players to do it, then you might have to change something. You might have to play a little bit of a deeper line and adapt what you do, maybe play in a mid block or something. Mm-hmm. Um, either that or he's telling the players to do it and they're just not doing it, in which case that's a bad sign as well. So either way, um, you know, he's he's got some issues to address there before this becomes a bigger problem. By the way, because they ran, you didn't mention because... a player for Napoli, which was a Polish, uh, Polish midfielder, Zelensky, who almost joined West Ham uh, last transfer window, he said no, he didn't want to go to West Ham. He wanted to stay in Italy, and uh, he's now the uh, leader of this team after Insigne left uh, and went to MLS. He's the leader of the team, and he was absolutely fantastic. He scored two goals. He was absolutely fantastic in this game. And 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 a funny story, funny story. Uh, when he was 19, Klopp uh, Klopp uh, was trying to sign him for Liverpool. He went to his house and. He tried to convince him to uh, to play for Liverpool, but I think Napoli was giving him uh, first team football from the from the from day one. That's how he ended up going to uh, to Napoli. Uh, no, sorry, it was Udinese. Udinese. He played for Udinese first. Yeah. Uh, let's go to another Champions League game from yesterday. Well, what's up, Martin? With uh, Spurs, who did you beat yesterday? And uh, Marseille. Marseille. The, the 10 men of Marseille. They were struggling against 11. <laughs> well, they started the game 11. They started the game 11. <laughs> and what was, what was the, the, the red card for? He dived or something? Or that was another game? That was, that was the... He, he brought Atletico the last Madrid player game. down. Okay. Yeah, a guy in an Atletico was. Madrid game on the opposite team dived, so he got a red card. But you're saying, so he brought the last player down. And, yeah, uh, and Bemba was was the final man. I think it was Son who was through. He just hacked him down. He was clean through as well. So yeah, it's a red. What time into the game was that? Second half. Yeah. And it was zero zero before that. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, we were pushing. We were pushing. It was just a question of time, and and the time came. 
I like Richarlison's <laughs> physicality. I the time was, came against the 10 or the time came against the 11? Uh, it was, it was an, an inevitable, inevitable, you know, they played, they played better and better, pushing more and more and more, you know, and it's one of those contest games that we would have scored anyway at some point. Against uh, the 10 or against the 11? I think against 11 we would have scored anyway. Uh, I feel like uh, there was a pretty strong chance we would. And um, listen, it's an interesting dilemma um, Conte has right now because Son is not particularly playing very well and he uh, has to play Richarlison with his form. Richarlison looks like the best transfer in the Premier League this season, you know, by far, so far. He looks absolutely amazing. Better than Haaland? Uh, you forget yeah, Haaland is a transfer? Maybe better than Haaland. <laughs> but uh, Haaland was so long ago that I almost forgot that he's in this transfer window because he was technically confirmed a, a long time ago. But yeah, it was this transfer window, so not, not better than Alan. But pretty pretty high at the top, I think. Uh, incredible signing. And uh, it's a huge dilemma because Kulusevski played very well and he had to sit down Kulusevski for the last two games. I think at some point he has to say, sit down uh, Son. And uh, Son has to, you know, accept that, uh, which will not be easy. But I like our rotation. Looks like Lucas Mora won't be able to get any uh, Type of uh, type of minutes at any time soon. Well, is Lucas Lucas Moore as a right sided player or left? Uh, he was tried to be as a right as a right back in one friendly game. It didn't work out, uh, so he's a right winger. Yeah, he's a right winger. But so, but how do you take Sun out the game when he's a left sided player? Because you can put Richarlison on either side. Does he? Is he? Does he? Is he a left sided player? Richarlison. He can play, he can play there. He can play both sides. Yeah. And it's not a fully wide role because the wing the wing backs are the wide players. The uh, the players either mm -hmm. side of Kane are sort of tucked in. Um, right. They're playing. It's quite a narrow role, so they're almost like a hybrid striker winger kind of thing. Yeah, they create um, channels for for the from the wing backs to push forward because they play three centre backs. So that's like so Paris and 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 the and the yeah, and the and the, uh, and the guys on the left sound sound and Richarlison they go to the middle, you know, and they're interchanged. It's a lot of, it's a good tactics. I, I like the way we play. I think uh, <laughs> it's a really good team. I'm very confident. Right. I, th I, thought you, I thought your best player last night, I mean, obviously Richarlison took the goals, but Emerson was very good for you guys. Yeah. Yeah, I remember mm -hmm. Hoberg, uh, uh, overall uh, has a pretty good season too. And I would say, I would mention uh, him as one of the players that surprised. He didn't allow Bisuma. Uh, he's a fighter. He didn't allow Bisuma to take his spot so far and We'll see what happens next. You know, that's that's kind of a surprising that Bisuma didn't break into the first starting lineup yet, but Hoiberg was playing well. I just have one last thing to throw in. Uh, Manchester United got beaten one nothing. Was it Real Sociedad today yeah. in uh, the yeah. Europa League? And, and uh, for everybody all week who was saying that VAR is better in Europe, you were wrong because we were clearly robbed. Like. Just when I was believing on the cliche, the cliche gets dispelled. Like I saw a guy die with his legs, the ball bounce off his legs and not hit his outstretched arms, but hit his elbow that was close to his body. And the referee called a penalty. So it's like, all right, VAR will look at this and turn this over. VAR didn't tell the referee shit. They said, go ahead and give that penalty to Real Social Dad, which they did. And Real Social Dad put the ball in the back of the net and won, won nothing on a call that shouldn't even have been a call. So that was messed up. There was one good call in Europe that I did love. It was uh, in the Barcelona versus Plzen game where the... Christensen was the last man, and I think it was on a cross or a pass, and Christensen was beaten, and it looked like he took the defender down. And, uh, and he got injured when he took the defender down. And then, so he's on the floor getting assistance from the, the medical staff. And the referee's standing over him with a red card. He's like, as soon as Christensen gets up, he's getting this red card. And then while he's getting stood over by the ref waiting to give him the red card, we start seeing the replays of the play. And it showed that the forward elbowed Christensen in the face. And then they told the ref to go look at it. He went and looked at it, came back, put the red card in his pocket, took out a yellow, 
and gave it to the attacking player like it should have, because that was a real clatter to the face. So, but yeah, it's fucked up everywhere. So good luck for for being consistent all across Europe and uh, ruining things. And sometimes doing good things. It's just, it, just congratulations on being inconsistent. Uh, so hopefully we'll have football in England this weekend. Let's see how the country's feeling about the, the queen. I guess uh, the P powers that be got to scour the internet to see what the vibe is, to do a vibe and look check. On, that's, that's always a bad thing. If they're looking online <laughs> to try and do that. I mean, it's it's getting a little crazy because uh, you know I, I was sharing earlier on the chat like what Trevor Sinclair said mm -hmm. on Twitter, and now he he works for Topsport, obviously, and there's now cause for him to be sacked from Topsport, and the official Topsport uh, Twitter handle replied to that saying we're trying to get in touch with Trevor and to figure out what he exactly means. This is an issue of serious concern, and we are going to investigate it. And like so. So he's going to get fired for saying that. Why should black and brown people mourn, you know, in the background of what the, what the queen has stood for? Essentially, that's what he said. Yeah. All right. What, what do you mean you have to find out what he means? You know what he did. You know what he means. History. Go read a history Yeah, read a book. book. Read a book. <laughs> Go read a history book and you'll see what Trevor Sinclair meant. Like, you, you, you have an education system. You taught it. You apparently learned some shit and regurgitated it back and he's in trouble for history and it's going to be so silly because now he the poor guy he'll have to like come out there and make an apology that he absolutely doesn't mean and he's terrible at standing up for himself because i see him sometimes mm -hmm. on talk sport like with like how uh what's his name the guy that he's on a station with can sometimes make him wither under his words oh, yeah. velocity of words so simon jordan okay simon jordan yeah so i i know I hope Trevor does not backpedal on this one. Just say, hey man, I'm just repeating back history. If you want to fire me for the history of this country, that's kind of bullshit and I will sue you, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and then that's it. And, and that's how I feel because, you know, like when, when, when the monarchy left England, they took the bank when they left Jamaica. They took the bank from the country. They didn't give a fuck. So I don't want anybody to die, but let's be honest. You know what I mean? She lived a good life. Let's not keep pretending, you know? And also, you she know? died of old age. Like, it, it, it's yeah, I didn't like even say long live the, the queen. She lived a long, great life, man. Yeah. Yeah. And and poor Charles, like, like you, you didn't... He's, you know, how long has he has the dude waited? Like, this should be a week of celebration, like like somebody finally got the job they've been they've been trying to get for yeah. the longest time. Yeah, with no beheadings or any bad thing <laughs> happening. Like somebody lived the full course of their life and enjoyed it. And Charles is gonna be king for two years now. By the way, <laughs> by the way, can you guys guess what was uh, Queen's favorite football club? Each has no, a what was it? Right. Has a what? What was her favorite football club? I don't know. What was? Uh, I know, but you, you take a guess. I'll tell you if you We don't it. have time to guess. You should tell us because it's three minutes left. Okay, West Ham. <laughs> you know what? I knew I didn't London. like her. <laughs> 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 this, right, doesn't well, Prince, isn't Prince William's team Aston Villa? Aston Villa. Yeah, yeah. I respect that. Villa fan. It's, it's something with the Clarets. Yeah, they both like res like respond to Clariton teams. Clariton, <laughs> right? Well, guys, thanks they, for coming on. Because they've shed a lot of blood over the years. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah. That's get it in. <laughs> get in there, Lee. Get in there. <laughs> All, right, All right, guys. guys. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate you taking time. Thanks. I'm um, in uh, Nyack Levity Live all weekend. Thanks, Martin, for coming through. Peace, y'all. Oh.